let's continue on for the program. So the second talk in this session will be given by Professor Michel Mayor. Professor Michel Mayor is Professor Emeritus at the University of Geneva, Switzerland. He and Professor Didier Quillo jointly shared the 2019 Nobel Prize in Physics with Professor James uh, Peeble for discoveries of uh, an exoplanet orbiting a solar type star. So please join me again in congratulating Professor Michel Mayor for this uh, uh, wonderful, uh, uh, great honor. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> the title of uh, his talk is uh, Exoplanets, 25 Years of uh, Discoveries. Okay. Please go ahead, let me have. Okay, sorry. Yes. So today I would say a few words on, of the history. The last century succeeded in a very important change of the paradigm of relative to exoplanet. And then after I will devote most of my time to the only things I know in the domain is the problem of Doppler spectroscopy and what we can expect for the future. Oh, the old question last century was, and before, was how many planetary systems do we have in the Milky Way? And it looks, today it looks very evident that we have discovered quite a lot of extrasolar planets. But this was absolutely not evident during the first part of the last century. It's very amazing to look the literature of expectation of uh, estimated number of planetary systems in the Milky Way. And until, uh, 1943, most of the estimation was between zero and only a couple of few. And in 1943, the ideas changed suddenly to several billions, hundreds of billions, but first for a very bad reason, but then after uh, for good physical reasons. And you see all, all the estimations stay at the level of, of billion or hundreds of billions, and this is quite compatible with the modern observation in that field. So I, I like to, to pay some credit to the people having uh, put their ideas correctly on this, in this domain. I, I like very much a very small letter uh, written by Otto Struve in 52, that because the, the missing problem was that, that we, we need to have some accretion disk to form planets. And in the first part of the century, it was not known how to produce significant nebula, planetary, protoplanetary nebula. And Stroh uh, observed that the lowest part of the main second stars was very slowly rotating. And he said, this suggests that these stars have converted the angular momentum to axial rotation with angular momentum uh, of orbital motion of planet. And uh, hence, we, we should have many objects of planet-like character in the galaxy. This was a very, very nice starting for a very, a very small detail with the low uh, rotation of uh, the, the main second stars. He said, this is uh, the good explanation. And then after, I would just mention a few references to the, the problem of uh, accretion disk. You have a lot of, of observation have uh, shown that it's possible to detect in the infrared the presence of this dust disk around stars. And for example, uh, if you look at this paper, this review paper by Beckwith and other colleagues, it says, our result demonstrates that disks more massive than the minimum mass of the protoplanet, protostellar system, commonly accompany the birth of solar mass stars and suggest that planetary systems are common in the galaxy. So see, all this was done before the discovery of exo, uh, any exoplanet. And then after you have this very, very uh, important discovery is the direct images of accretion disk made by uh, the space telescope, Hubble Space Telescope, uh, orbiting very young stars in the Orion Nebula. So most of stars, low mass stars should have uh, protoplanetary disk. And th this was in 95. So it was a good idea, a good, yeah. 
and, and I would just show that following the questions and the proposal for a project made by Otto Struve, that in the 80s, a lot of people tried different uh, design to develop new kind of, of spectrograph to achieve the precision needed. Because at the, in, the, in the 50s, 60s, the precision was typically of one kilometer per second or something like, absolutely not compatible with the detection of planet. Then after you have a, a, few, a lot of different ideas, I've shown in, in yellow only the, the ideas having been followed by a real survey. So you have the Campbell and Walker with the adrenal fluoride cell achieving something like 15 meters per second. And then you have a group of, of California, Marcia Butler with iodine cell. And in Geneva, we have followed a different approach with fibers and the technique of cross correlation. And we achieve the something like similar precision of 15 meters per second. And this technique succeeded to give the first detection in 95 with in Old Provence Observatory. And then after the story continue, and in 2003, we put in operation a new spectrograph, ARPS, uh, at ESO and a 3.6 meter telescope. And we have currently, we arrive at the level of one meter per second. And finally, uh, last two years ago, in fact, uh, a new instrument in, uh, installed by Francesco Pepe and colleagues at, at um, Paranal Observatory achieve 0 0.1, 0 0.2 meter per second. It's very impressive. I will go back to this, to these ideas. So this 51 peg, very known idea, uh, object, okay, with a period that's shown only 4.2 days and the mass of uh, about half the mass of Jupiter and so on, completely unexpected kind of planet the, uh, at the time. Uh, because 4.2 days for, was not expected. For, for, from the formation scenario of planet. And uh, it's, I, I like very much uh, this story because in fact, the, the, the reason for, for this short period object was already uh, inside the, the literature because you have a paper by Goldrash and Tremen in the 1980s showing that you should have orbital migration when you have a, an embedded young planet in a uh, accretion disk, you have a strong orbital migration uh, with a very short time scale. And it's not the only paper. You have Papaloidzu, Lin, Ward, and many papers was devoted to this. And it's very strange that nobody take into account these ideas to search for planets that we could have very short, massive planet. And just after the discovery of 51 peg, Lynn, Bodenheimer, and Richardson showed that this uh, they gave, gave the, 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 the explanation of the short period of, of uh, 51 peg. And now presently, orbital migration is, is part of all formation scenario of planetary formation. I believe this, uh, this was very important, but this gave a lot of confidence to people it's easy to detect planets. Then after we, 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 we took uh, some initiative to, to search for planet in the, in the southern hemisphere, and we have developed a new kind of spectrograph, ARPS, uh, on the 3.6 meter telescope, and we achieve the precision of, uh, of uh, one meter per second. It's a vacuum spectrograph with high resolution and so on, very stable in temperature and so on. And this is still working. It's about oh, from almost 20 years, it, it, it uses the, the totality of the time of the telescope. So this is uh, uh, on the top, you have the 3.6 meter telescope and below you have the 1.2 earlier telescope we're also using to search for planet. And this you see Didier Kelo on, on this picture. So it's, it's very impressive. So this is, uh, that a lot of the progress in that field was due to the technology. Uh, my first uh, instrument, spectrograph at cross-correlation, uh, almost 40, 40 years ago, 
uh, achieved three meters per second, and we were very happy at the time with such a precision. It was on a one meter telescope, it's source of course, and so on. And I will not give the details of all the different instruments, but just look the last one, Espresso, uh, with a precision at the level of 0 0.1 meter per second, and connected to four 8.2 meter telescopes on top of the Parana. It's a factor 3,000 of increase of the precision. Evidently, every time you increase the precision, you have the capability to detect lower mass planet. So this is the reason why I, I, I say this is a path to the detection of Earth-type planet. We can see this, uh, the influence of this project when you are looking at the, the mass of the detected planet uh, face, uh, with the discovery here of this object. And okay, you can this huge rate of, uh, uh, of discovery, but you see the lower envelope is uh, going down from several hundred times the mass of the Earth to less than the, the mass of the Earth. So this is the signature of the strategy of measurement and progress of instrumentation. From, so from that time, and still, still continuing at La Silla with a huge number of, of observing night, we try to have a complex, uh, complete survey of a very different sample. And doing this with the uh, ARPS instrument, we succeed to detect this population of uh, what is called super Earths. So a huge uh, population of planets with, between, with the mass between one and 10 times the mass of the Earth. And this, is not, this kind of planet, very frequent apparently, are not pre pre present at all in the, in the solar system. And why we are continuing to do this kind of, uh, of survey? Because it's, it's part of the possibility to give some constraint to people developing model. Because the formation of planet is it's very complicated. You have orbital migration, you have accretion, you have uh, evaporation, you have interaction with other planet form and so on. So you need to have additional constraint. And I will just show you, you have several group working in, in the theory for the formation of planet. For example, you have the team of Shigeru Ida in Tokyo and Doug Lim in, in California and in Bern, you have bands and colleagues. So we try always to compare this kind of survey with a the theory. And this is typically what these people do in medicine. When you combine accretion and migration, you can see the, not, not only the code is give some, some ideas of the composition uh, I see on rocky planet, but you see how you can populate the diagram between mass and semi-major axis. So, okay, it's, it's very difficult. We don't expect a very strict 100% compa uh, of correct comparison, but give some ideas what is important in this, this field. If you have so many short period planets, in fact, you have a good probability, 10 to times, to have a uh, transiting planet. And in uh, 99, we have discovered a planet with uh, a period as short as 3.5 days. And we, we collaborate with people in US, with Dave Charbonneau, Tim Brown, and Dave Latham. And uh, in fact, the orbital plane was just uh, compatible with the, with the transit. So this was observed with a uh, with a big telescope, with a small 10, 10 centimeter telescope in the garage of Tim Brown. And you see that exactly at the good time, you have the, 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 the deep of the luminosity. And one year later, uh, Brown and Charbonneau repeat the measurement with, with the Hubble Space Telescope. And you see the huge quality you can have for the photometry. And immediately you have an idea. You say, if you, you can have some beautiful photometry, you can you have a chance to detect a much smaller planet. Because you see once one percent on this diagram. Uh, in parallel, you can just do the very simple calculation. If you have the mass from the Doppler and the size from the transit, you can determine that it is a bulk density and it's only 0.3 gram per cubic centimeter. 
as this was direct proof, uh, it is really a Gaza Sphere planet. Because still at the time, some colleague was not convinced that it was planned. So now we arrived at the time, uh, having follow up for, from this idea of uh, to search for transiting planet, and you have this this huge gal uh, quantity of result obtained by the Kepler telescope, and you see this is a, a plot with a radius versus period with multiplanetary system, huge number, thousands of planets in a very small part of the Milky Way. But then here you have the size of the planet. And it, if you want to do some physics, you need to have the mass. And this, again, we have to do something, I collaborate with his colleagues. And uh, you see here, this is a plot where you have uh, on one side above plot, you have the distribution of size observed by the Kepler telescope. And below you have the measurement made of the mass in different survey, not the same sample, made at Keck with Howard and ourself in Chile. So you see, small planets are extremely, extremely frequent. So unhappily, the, the field of Kepler are in, in the northern sky. So we have been obliged to build a second ARPS instrument implemented on 3.5 meter telescope at Canary Island. And here you see the second instrument. And uh, from that time, we devote most of the observing time of this new instrument to explore the relationship between the radius and the mass for the smallest planet. Because as this kind of cross correlation technique is quite efficient, we, we have a, a good instrument to explore the mass of this low mass Kepler detection. And here you have the very classical plot. And you see that you can compare. And you see that up to about five times the mass of the Earth, you have some object rocky type uh, planet. And then after you have a much larger size because you have a big envelope and so on. And this is. Uh, in the few years ago, uh, the idea was that the, the largest uh, rocky planet could be at the size of the Earth. And, and here you see that you can have rocky planet much more massive. So this is not a, this is a real idea, uh, image of the sun. And you see that also in the small box, here the size, the comparable size of the planet in the solar system. You see the blue one, it's a very small one. This is, this is the Earth. And when you have the transit of this very small dot in front of this disk, you see a lot of, of perturbation you have. And it's very, very difficult to have a very precise uh, transit curve. To, and also, uh, the mass of the Earth is so small compared to the, the mass of the, of, the, of the star that evidently the reflex motion, the wobble, is very, very small. So it's not easy to detect planet and to characterize Earth-type planet. So some colleagues start a very systematic search to all the first to, to explore the change of apparent velocity of the sun due to the jitter in the atmosphere, evidently, uh, with a small, teles a small, very small telescope uh, taking the integrated light of the, of, the, of the sun and always connected every day, every day, with the ARPS instrument at La Palma first and then recently in Chile also, just to see what is uh, the velocity uh, of the star, sun as a star radial velocity. And uh, it's very interesting to see that it's not so easy. And because you have so many physical process changing the apparent velocity, you have the magnetic, the magnetic uh, cycle with a very long period. We have a lot of, of observations showing that the velocity of ap the apparent velocity of star change over years, like we have the solar cycle. If you are looking uh, on a shorter, shorter period, you have all the spots and, and anisotropy in the atmosphere producing change at the, at the, at the time scale of few uh, about the months. Then after you have the problem of the granulation, 
And then after you have the problem of the uh, oscillation with five minutes and so on. So you have a huge number of, of process, of physical process. And here you have the, the result of this monitor, uh, preliminary result of this monitoring of the velocity of the, of the sun. The sun, it's a, it's, a, it's a quite old, stable star. And this was done at the time of the, when it's low activity part of the sun. And you see that you have huge change of several meters per second of the apparent velocity. So uh, some people try to, to, to try to analyze with a clever algorithm to try to eliminate this, this uh, intrinsic noise. And for example, this example made by uh, Andrew Collier Cameron and, and colleagues shows that they succeed to, with some kind of filtering process, to, to go down to something like half meter per second. But eventually, uh, a planet like Venus induces uh, an amplitude of 0.1 meter per second. So you see, we can do something. We can do some better things with the physics of the tra transfer, radiative transfer, but it's really difficult to get a very precise velocities. So I would just mention uh, the, the, the best of a uh, series of instruments we have. It's called Espresso, uh, implement, uh, installed about a bit more one year at Paranal Observatory. It's a consortium of several countries led by Francesco Pepe. And uh, it, one, uh, several characteristics of its one. Uh, this instrument could be connected to, to the four eight meter telescope. So this, it could receive the light or equivalent to a 16 meter telescope. Because if you want to have the precision needed to, to see the small wobble, you really need a lot, a lot of photons. Okay, you need a stable instrument, but in addition, you need a lot of photons. Uh, we can use this instrument evidently for many things, not only the idea as a driver was for us at least, was to, to start for hockey planet, but that you can look for the variability of fundamental constant. You can look for the abundance in the local group of galaxies and things like this. It's a powerful instrument, very stable. So you see, it's a big vacuum tank. You see the size compared to people. And it's, it's, a, it's a very, uh, with a very high stabilization uh, of the temperature. You see that it's a level of the milli Kelvin also to advantage the vacuum. And uh, this was the very first measurement during the commissioning that you see that uh, the people having done the commissioning observe uh, uh, with very short exposure that they achieve a precision of, of 0.28 centimeter. Uh, no, 28 centimeter, but the photon noise was already 25 centimeter. So the, it's not really easy to prove that it's 0.1 meter per second. We are quite at the level. And you need to see the time for the, for the exposure. It's only a few minutes. This is the advantage to have a big telescope. So you see the possibility of to connect all this, the light coming from all the big telescope to the single spectrograph. Uh, always behind what I said, it's a huge, you are, the cross relation technique is a very simple technique to condensate all the Doppler information uh, embedded in the spectra. Here you see, this is only 10% of the spectral range of Expresso. You will thousand, thousand of lines. So this is the advantage of this technique. Very, very easy way to concentrate the informa information. Evidently, this instrument, uh, the same instrument could be used to analyze the chemistry of, uh, of planetary atmosphere, uh, what is called the transmission spectroscopy. A lot, a lot of good results have been uh, achieved in that domain from the time of the very precursor paper by Dave Charbonneau many years ago, having shown that you have access to the chemistry of the, when you compare the spectra of the star 
behind and or in front when the planet is in front or behind the star. So you have access to the to the, the atmosphere chemi comp chemical composition of planets. That is not my domain, so I will not discuss. So the next evidently important, the most important point is do uh, what is life? Do we have life in, on other places in the cosmos? Is life a cosmic imperative? So what we have to, to, to do to, to answer this question? So find transiting planet orbiting bright stars. So you have a, a series of space mission, TESS, Keops, Plato, James Webb could contribute to this. After you have the problem, you have to, to determine the mass. This is a Doppler spectroscopy, and you see it's not so easy to go below 0.1 meter per second. And so it's a problem to de design very precise table cross correlation spectrograph on big telescope because you need a lot of photons. But in addition, you need to understand better the, uh, how to eliminate the jitter of the, uh, the velocity jitter of star. Then after you have the possibility to do so simply high resolution spectroscopy and to search for uh, the characteristic of the, of the planet atmosphere and if you are lucky to detect biomarker. This could be done from the ground or from space. And I will finish with just uh, show this picture with quite a few of, of um, people having contributed to this domain. Alex Volkshan, uh, people from, from uh, Kepler, Dave Charbonneau, and Jeff Marcy. So it's, it's all done in the, in the, in the US uh, in the conference a couple of years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Michelle. So uh, we can open for some questions. Unfortunately, I cannot mute the questions for whatever reason. So here I would ask uh, Mark to help me to read a few questions to the audience and as well as to Michelle. Mark, please. Yes, so we, I have one question that's been relayed to me for Michelle. Uh, it's Alfred Tang. Uh, how do you tell the difference between an exoplanet and a giant space rock captured by gravitation? I'm not sure to have understood the question. Please uh, repeat the question. I guess the question is, how do you know that what you're looking at is an exoplanet rather than just a giant space rock captured by gravitation? Oh, uh, you, you, well, today we have already quite a lot of system where you have several planet or exoplanet orbiting the same star. So it's very difficult to believe, to believe that they have been captured and all on almost uh, orbits with resonance between the orbits. No, I believe we are not afraid at all by, by this possibility. Mark, any other questions, please? Uh, I, I don't have another question for Michelle yet, but we could go back. There were a few that were asked for Jim, if he would like to um, answer those. I can unmute Jim. Yes, once again, uh, my apologies that I simply could not read any questions I could not see for, for whatever technical reason. So, uh, Jim, would you be able to reconnect and uh, turn on your, yes. uh, uh, unmute yourself? All right. I have there, a, I there are few questions. Jim. Um, yeah, I have, there are a few questions. I have a, a few more for, uh, maybe before we go back to Jim, I have a few more for Michelle. That's, that's please, go ahead for okay. that, yeah. So, Michelle, uh, uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, uh, is Aaron Hu. Uh, what is the significance of discovering exoplanets? Oh, in the past, or well, at least my colleague astrophysicists are already very happy to have some possibility to understand the formation process of, of planets. So it's a question of, of uh, astrophysicists. But evidently for the general public, but also for, for colleagues, the, the ultimate goal is to, to, to see what is our place in the universe. Uh, what is the place of life in the universe? Do we have life at every place in the universe or is it a very unique process? And when I say life, it's not only uh, people like us, 
but already a bacteria unicellular in some form of life uh, during the most the, the longest part of the existence of the, uh, earth in fact life was only existing in very simple form of orga organism great uh i have one more question for you this is from miguel castro colin uh are masses and spectros spectroscopy content of planets correlated in any way? So, are, are masses and spectroscopy content of planets correlated in any way? Oh, uh, if, okay, you, are, you have some rocky planet and gaseous plan planet. So, say, evidence is chemistry are quite different. Well, I don't know to, to understand exactly the idea, but what we observed during from about 20 years is a very strong correlation between the chemical composition of stars and the frequency of giant planet so if you are looking at the most uh, the richest planet in the solar vicinity with a fa over h of 0 point plus 0 point 0.3 or something like this so a factor two in addition to, uh, larger than the uh, heavy elements in the sun. In fact, you have 25% to have gases to the planet. But at the opposite, if it's slightly deficient, in fact, it's only one or two percent. So you have a strong uh, indirect proof that you need heavy material to form planets. Great. Mark, Thank any you. other questions? There are a few more, but I don't know if you want to get, have time to go back to you, um, I, to go back to Jacob. Time, timing wise, we're okay. Why don't you find one more, and uh, we'll continue afterwards. Okay. Um, yeah, there's quite a number of questions here, actually. So, um, so from Christine Yi, what are some methods of exoplanet detection that have been proposed in recent years, which may have potential? So, uh, okay, if it's evident that the, the technique of the, of the transiting planet have proved that the capability to, to detect extremely low mass planet, huge number and so on. But when you want to do some physics to understand the chemical composition and so on, you, you need to combine uh, Doppler spectroscopy and transiting planet. Uh, it's not the only possibility. Uh, I believe for the future, myself, I, I will put a lot of, of credit to the potential of uh, spectroscopy. When you will have a huge telescope, let's say 20, 30 meters telescope, uh, you, when you compare the spectra of uh, a transiting planet, when she, as a planet is in front of behind, you have access to the chemical composition of the atmosphere. So if you have a huge number of photons, you can do much better statistics, or not the statistics, better uh, determination of the chemical composition of planet. And evidently you have quite a lot of additional planet. For example, to explore the very distant planet, you have the gravity micro lensing, you have, uh, and, and maybe in the future, you will have also a lot of possibility from astrometry. For example, Gaia, I believe in, I don't know when will be the release, maybe in one year or two, will, I'm sure, will announce quite a lot of, of planets detected by astrometry. The old technique looked for by Peter van der Kamp and other people several dozen of years ago. Uh, 